Prime Minister promised integrity, professionalism and accountability in government. His Home Secretary has leaked information, is overseeing chaos in the Home Office and has broken the law. What will she actually have to do to get the sack? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, the Home Secretary made an error of judgment, but she recognised her mistake and took accountability for her actions. But she has now set out transparently, in detail, a full sequence of events in a letter to the Labour Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, offered to share relevant documents uh, with the Chair, and she is now getting on with the job. Cracking down on crime, defending our borders, something I know the party opposite has no interest in supporting. <laughs> My 19-year-old Congleton constituent, Mary, who has been in care much of her life, has worked long and hard by childminding and in other ways to save £3,600 to help support herself at university. Mary now faces her university studies with no savings and no means of recovering them because it has all been stolen from her in a few seconds by a heartless scammer oh, pretending oh, to be her bank. Oh. What assurance can the Prime Minister give that the government is working hard to help prevent this type of all too common despicable crime and bring the Absolutely. perpetrators to book? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about Marie's case that my honourable <laughs> friend raises and I know how convincing scammers can be and the upset and hurt that they cause. I'm pleased to reassure my honourable friend that the government will shortly be publishing our fraud strategy, which will establish a more unified, coordinated response from government and law enforcement and the private sector to block more scams and to better protect the public. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. His Home Secretary says the asylum system is broken. Who broke it? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, let's, let's just, we, we can look at the record on migration yeah. policy. Let's look at it. What did, what did, what, what did we on this side of the House do? We gave the British people a referendum on Brexit. We, we, delivered, we delivered Brexit. We ended the free movement of people, Mr Speaker. That's our record on migration policy. It's not something the Honourable Gentleman supported. He opposed it at every turn, and it's not what the British people want. No one wants open borders on this side of the House. They've lost control of the borders on their side of the House. Mr Speaker, four, four Prime Ministers in five years, and it's the same old, same old, who stands there and tries to pass the blame. If the asylum system is broken, and his lot have been in power for 12 years, how can it be anyone's fault but theirs? Mr Speaker, people rightly want to see us getting a grip of migration in our borders. But look, let's look at the record. Let's look at the record. The Right Honourable Gentleman, he voted against the Nationality and Borders Bill. He said he, he said he would scrap the Rwanda partnership. He opposed the ending of free movement of people. Look, border control, border control is a serious, complex issue. But not only does the party opposite not have a plan, they have opposed every single measure we have taken to solve the problem. You can't attack a plan if you don't have a plan. We voted against it because we said it wouldn't work, and it hasn't worked. He, he says he's getting a grip, he's got a plan. So let's have a look at that plan. The Rwanda deal was launched in April. It cost the taxpayer £140 million and rising. The number of people deported to Rwanda is zero. Since then, 30,000 people have crossed the channel in small bloats. It's not working, is it? He hasn't got a grip. Yeah. Prime Minister. 
Mr Speaker, we on this side of the House are clear that we want to defend our borders. When the Shadow Home Secretary this weekend was asked, she couldn't answer a simple question if the party opposite was in favour of higher or lower migration. It's that simple. The Home Secretary and I, when it comes to tackling our migration, reducing migration, we are on the same page. That party's policy, it's a blank page, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, blame others, deflect, attack on something else. So much for the new age of accountability. Of all the people who arrived in small boats last year, how many asylum claims have been processed? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we do need, we do need. Mr Speaker, not enough is the answer, very straightforwardly. Not enough. And that's what we're going to fix. But the Honourable honourable Gentleman raises this question, what are we doing? We've increased the number of processing officials by 80%. We are putting an extra 500 more by next March. But if he really, if he really was serious about fixing this problem, then he would acknowledge that we do need to tackle the issue of people putting spurious, spurious claims, spurious repeated last minute claims to frustrate the process. That's how we'll tackle the system. So why then did he vote against the Nationality and Borders Act, which deals with it? Mr Speaker, he says, he says not enough. You could say that again. It's 4%. 4% of people arriving in small boats last year had their asylum claim processed. According to the bookies, the Home Secretary has a better chance of becoming the next Tory leader than she has of processing an asylum claim in a year. <laughs> and he talks about numbers. They're only taking half the number of asylum decisions that they used to. That's why the system is broken. Yeah. 4,000 people at the Manston Air Force Base, massively overcrowded, all sorts of diseases breaking out. So, did the Home Secretary receive legal advice that she should move people out? Yes or no? Prime Minister. Mr Mr. Speaker, the the right honourable gentleman is very fond of reminding us that he used to be the former Director of Public Prosecutions. So he knows the government's policy on le- commenting on legal advice. But what I can say is the significant action that the Home Secretary has taken to fix the issue. Since September, 30 more hotels with 4,500 new beds, appointing a senior general to control the situation at Manston, and indeed increasing the number of staff there by almost a half, Mr. Speaker. These are significant steps to demonstrate that we are getting a grip of this system. But this is a serious and escalating problem. We will make sure that we control our borders and we will always do it fairly and compassionately because that's the right thing. Here's Starmer. Mr Speaker, he talks about my time as Director of Public Prosecutions. I prosecuted people smugglers. He can't even get an asylum claim process. I think the answer to the question whether the Home Secretary received legal advice to move people out of Marsden is yes. He just hasn't got the guts to say it. He did a grubby deal with her, putting her in charge of Britain's security just so he could dodge an election. She's broken the ministerial code, lost control of a refugee centre and put our security at risk. She did get one thing right. She finally admitted that the Tories have broken the asylum system. Criminal gangs running amok, thousands crossing the channel in small boats every week, hardly any claims processed. So why doesn't he get a proper Home Secretary, scrap the Rwanda gimmick, crack down on smuggling gangs, end the small boat crossings, speed up asylum claims and agree an international deal on refugees? Start governing for once and get a grip. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, the, the right, the right honourable gentleman. Front rows, can we just calm it down a little? I do want to hear the replies. You're covering your mouth is not helpful to me or you. Come on, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the right honourable gentleman rightly raised the topic of national security, because it is important. But this is the person, this is the person who in 2019 told the BBC, and I quote, I do think Jeremy Corbyn would make a great Prime Minister. Let's let's remember 
Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let's remember that national security agenda, abolishing our armed forces, scrapping the nuclear deterrent, withdrawing from NATO, voting against every single anti-terror law we try, befriending Hamas and Hezbollah. He may want to forget about it, but we will remind him of it every week because it's the Conservative government that will keep this country safe. to my register of interest. Mr Speaker, right now we are suffering the worst outbreak of avian flu ever recorded. Hundreds of thousands of birds are being destroyed to stem the spread of this terrible disease. The government's acted quickly to bring forward compensation to, for live birds culled to 48 hours after confirmation of disease, but even this short delay is causing significant losses to farmers in Broadland as the disease wreaks havoc to flocks. Dead birds are not compensated. Today is Back British Farming Day. Will my right hon. Friend take this opportunity to back British farmers and agree compensation for all affected birds from the date when disease is confirmed? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, as someone who represents a very rural and farming community, it is a great pleasure to back British Farming Day and join with colleagues on all sides of the House in doing so. Uh, but my hon. Friend is right to highlight that outbreaks of avian flu this year are on track to be some of the worst on record. That is why we have toughened up biosecurity measures on poultry farms, and I can say to him that we have confirmed we will now pay compensation from the outset of planned culling rather than at the end, a request that I know he and the farming sector will warmly welcome. Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In May of this year, the new Prime Minister told this chamber, and I quote, I can reassure the House that next year's benefits will be uprated by this September CPI and the triple lock will apply for the state pension. But last week, the Prime Minister repeatedly refused to see if he would keep to a promise that he made only five months ago. Uh Prime Minister, people don't need to hear any more spin about compassionate conservatism. People just need a straight answer to a simple question. Will he keep his promise and lift benefits and pensions in line with inflation? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, we do now have an excellent new Chancellor, and I'm looking forward to his autumn statement in a couple of weeks. It wouldn't be right It wouldn't be right to comment on individual policy measures before then, but I think everyone knows we do face a challenging economic outlook and difficult decisions will need to be made. But what I would say is that we will always, as my track record as Chancellor demonstrates, have fairness and compassion at the heart of everything we do. Well, Mr Speaker, it was a very simple question asking for the Prime Minister to reiterate what he promised just five months ago. For the second week running, he still won't give a straight answer to the most vulnerable that require support. The Prime Minister keeps telling us that difficult decisions need to be made, but austerity 2.0 isn't a difficult decision. It is what it has always been, a Tory political choice to hit the poorest hardest. In the week that BP saw quarterly profits of £7.1 billion. Why not take the easy decision to bring in a proper windfall tax? Why not take the easy decision to reinstate the cap on bankers' bonuses? Why not take the easy decision to scrap the non-DOM tax avoidance? And with all that new revenue, why not stand up today and take the easiest decision of all? to protect those most in need and increase benefits and pensions in line with inflation. Mr Mr. Speaker, the uh, Honourable Honourable Gentleman raised the issue of North Sea, and this is a point of significant difference between his party and ours. As Chancellor, I introduced the new levy on oil and gas companies because I believe that was the right thing to do. But where we will always differ is we believe that our North Sea producers do have an important role to play in our transition to net zero. They are an important source of transition fuels, and we will make sure that we support them to invest in exploiting those resources for the British people. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I firstly welcome the IPU delegation from Madagascar, who are in today's uh, gallery. More locally, I'm delighted that next year Open Reach will be rolling out ultra-fast broadband in Wigginton in my constituency. Yeah, yeah. But other rural areas of South West Hertfordshire, like Duswell, are still in dire need of better connectivity. Yeah. Can the Prime Minister update the House on the progress of the £5 million project Gigabit? 
proposal. Prime Minister, my uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right to recognise the role of broadband in providing levelling up opportunities across our economy. That's why we invested £5 billion in Project Gigabit, uh, and now we have 71% of UK premises having access to this from just 5% uh, when we came into office. I'm very pleased to tell my honourable friend that we will be launching a procurement to provide Gigabit coverage for his area in the coming weeks. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will know that it's Scotland's energy resources that feed corporate profits and keep His Majesty's Treasury pumped full of cash to the tune of £8 billion in the last nine months alone. In return, candidates in the summer Tory leadership contest tried to outdo each other in their contempt and hostility to Scotland's democracy. So without falling back on the you've had your vote trope, can the Prime Minister tell me, is Scotland in a voluntary and respectful union of equals as claimed in 2014, or are we hostages in a territorial British colony? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, what, what people across Scotland rightly want to see is both their governments working constructively together to improve their lives. That's what we will do on this side of the House. And part of that is actually supporting Scottish energy producers, which he is right, have a vital role to play in enabling our transition to net zero and improving our energy security. And those Scottish companies will have our full support. Scott Benson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Nearly 40,000 illegal immigrants have crossed the Channel so far this year, landing taxpayers with a hotel bill of £5.6 million per day to accommodate them. Is it any wonder that millions of people in this country are furious with the situation? Prime Minister, during the summer you set out a comprehensive ten-point plan to tackle this issue. Everybody on this side of the chamber wants you to succeed in this aim. When can we expect the firm action the British people are demanding? Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, I know, I know this issue is rightly a priority for my honourable friend. It's a priority for his constituents, and I can reassure them that it is a priority for me and this government too. Whether it's the Nationalities and Borders Act or the further measures we are planning to take, we will defend our borders, stop the illegal crossings, and ensure that there is fairness and compassion in our system. That is the way to restore trust, and that is what his constituents and the British people deserve. Jimmy Still. Here, here, here. Mr Speaker, <clears throat> I have a constituent who is a supermarket worker. She is paid four weekly because she receives one double salary payment. There is one month of the year where she receives no universal credit. Normally not an issue, Mr Speaker. However, because universal credit is linked to the cost of living payment, my constituency now no longer qualifies for the £320 that could see her through the very worst of a cold Highland winter. What could the Prime Minister do to mend this gap in the cost of living support? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, what I can tell uh, the Honourable Gentleman is we also provided discretionary funding, which was provided through Barnet to the Scottish Government, especially to deal with cases like the one that he raised. But we would be very happy if he wants to write to us with the constituents' details to look into it. But discretionary funding was made available, especially for cases like that. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was visited at one of my surgeries in Broxtow by my constituent, Aaron Horsey. In his arms was his three-week-old newborn baby, Tim. Aaron's wife, Bernadette, tragically passed away whilst giving birth to Tim. Aaron came to see me regarding the disparity that exists over shared parental leave. The current eligibility requirements differ between that of the surviving birthing partner as compared to the surviving non-birthing partner. And this meant in Aaron's case he was not entitled to leave to raise his son. Would the Prime Minister ensure that both my constituent and I can meet with the relevant minister to make sure that we move towards a future where parents are not in this position. Prime Minister. Well, I know, I know the whole House will join me in extending our condolences to Aaron following the tragic loss of his wife, and I thank my honourable friend for raising this issue. Employed parents can benefit from statutory support depending on personal circumstances. I'm very concerned 
to hear that that is not happening in this case, and I will, of course, ensure that he gets a meeting with a relevant minister as soon as possible to resolve this issue. Deirdre Brock. Speaker. Uh, will the PM join me in condemning opaquely funded so-called think tanks who exert so much influence on gullible politicians that their policies were able to almost crash the UK economy just weeks ago? Open Democracy reports a former member of the Charity Commission has board has called for the Institute of Economic Affairs to be stripped of its charitable status, saying the very purpose of the IEA, shrinking the state, is political. Is it right this body receives charitable tax status? And will the PM meet with me to discuss the influence bodies such as the IEA exert on politicians, including what, poli what influence they still have with him? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, obviously charitable status is a matter, matter for the Charities Commission, but more generally, I actually do believe in free speech and vibrant debate of ideas. That is a good thing, and we should do absolutely nothing to stamp it out, even when we disagree with it. Dr Julian Lewis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the run-up to the autumn statement, will my right honourable friend do everything he can to persuade the Chancellor to assist those people who took out mortgages in good faith and now are at risk of losing their homes through unaffordable increases? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, my, my right honourable friend is absolutely right uh, to raise mortgage payments. It's why it is absolutely crucial that we put our public finances on a sustainable footing to limit the increase in interest rates, because ultimately that is what puts pressure on people's mortgage payments. That's what this government is determined to do. And in the short term, there are a, a support available through the welfare system for those with mortgage payments, and I hope he can direct his constituent to those. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given the continued Russian invasion and the now illegal annexation of parts of Ukraine, Will the Prime Minister recommit his government to pursuing the full and proper accountability, including through the International Criminal Court, of those who violate international law in territories that they occupy? And in particular, will he pursue the rigorous application of the Fourth Geneva Convention in terms of the treatment of civilian populations in militarily occupied areas? Yeah. Yeah. The uh, Honourable Minister. Gentleman for his uh, question, which is absolutely right. I can confirm we will continue with the policy that the previous government put in place, and I think it's something that we can be proud of that we provided, I think, the earliest technical support to gather evidence to put cases together for future prosecutions at the ICC. We will continue to gather evidence, provide support to the Ukrainians, because he's absolutely right. What we are hearing is abhorrent, it's wrong, and those that, who are conducting these things must be held to account. Simon Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My right honourable friend and I both represent rural constituencies, and he will know the difficulty in securing both NHS dentistry and GPs in rural areas. We on this side of the House know that the financial decisions that he and the Chancellor are going to be taking are going to be tough. Notwithstanding that, can I urge him to ensure that as many initiatives as possible can be supported and put in place? in order to make sure that GPs and dentists know that working in rural areas is an attractive place yeah. and to encourage their recruitment and retention. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. My, my honourable friend is absolutely right about the importance of healthcare provision in rural areas, which our constituents feel acutely because of the distances they have to travel. Uh, I, he has my assurance we will continue to prioritise both dentistry and GP recruitment to make sure that everyone in this country has access to the primary health care that they need and deserve. Chris Blav. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to be bullied into silence by anybody in this house. With the highest peacetime tax rates, food inflation running at 11.6 per cent, mortgage rates rising dramatically and a £50 billion hole in the public finances, the Prime Minister knows that Britain's broke. What is it about the 12 years of Tory rule and five years of him as a minister that has made such a mess of Britain? Mr Speaker, when it, when it comes to the economy, the, the Honourable Gentleman just failed to mention the single biggest cause of the challenges that we face right now, which is, 
which is absolutely the, aft the aftermath of a global pandemic, which has affected supply chains across the world, and an illegal war being conducted by Putin, which is leading to high energy prices. These are the root cause of the challenges we are facing. The challenges we are facing are global in nature. It is wrong to say that they are particular to this country now. And we will, of course, do what we always do on this side of the House, deliver a strong economy for the British people. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In last summer's heatwave, people across Essex witnessed terrible fires. And last month in Ethiopia, I witnessed the horrific climate change-driven drought that is forcing millions of people across the Horn of Africa to the brink of famine. I've discussed climate change with my right honourable friend. I know he cares, and it's great that he's going to Sharm el Sheikh. But we, the UK, brought the world to Glasgow for COP26. It's vital that we remain world leaders on climate cha change. So please confirm this government will fulfil the promises that we, the UK, made in Glasgow. Yes, sir. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for her work and role that she has played in us championing the fight against climate change. Uh, and I agree with her. There is no long-term prosperity without action on climate change, and there is no energy security without investment in renewables. That's why I will attend COP27 next week to deliver, to deliver Mr Speaker, on Glasgow's legacy of building a secure, clean and sustainable future. Thank you, Mr Speaker. While the Prime Minister was secretly recorded boasting to friends that he had helped divert money away from deprived areas like Coventry towards wealthy areas, staff of Coventry's hospital are still paying £600 a year to park at work. So when will the Prime Minister stop hammering working people in my community? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I think the Honourable Lady was asking about car parking in NHS hospitals, if I understood her rightly. We did introduce temporary free car parking during the pandemic. That was the right thing to do. And now all NHS, NHS trusts that charge for parking have implemented our free parking manifesto commitment for those in the greatest need, including hard-working NHS staff who work overnight. Speaker, on back British Farming Day, will the Prime Minister recognise with all members of the House the important role that farmers take and recognise that public money for public good means producing food in this country? But could he also recognise the value that our trade deals are doing in allowing us to export our high quality produce around the world, in particular the Australia Agreement, where a member of this House will be able to enjoy a certain delicate cut in his bush trucker trials? <laughs> Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I agree with my honourable friend. British farmers are indeed the lifeblood of our nation. I join him in celebrating their contribution. I agree with him we need to prioritise food security, and he is right to champion free trade deals. They open up new markets and new opportunities for great British produce, and we will continue to open up more markets for our farmers everywhere. British Sherman. Mr Speaker, uh, can I welcome uh, the first uh, Prime Minister from, York, from Yorkshire for a very long time, but, uh, and I'm trying to be kind to him this morning. Uh, isn't it the fact that since he resigned as Chancellor Exchequer on the 5th of July, we've had the most turbulent economic and political disaster in our country that any of us can remember? And when he, when he reflects on that, would he also think why, when he was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, he did not uh, help ordinary working people as well as he could? <laughs> yes. And well, why would, can he now take the opportunity to tax the non-DOMs, who are 70,000 of them, that are getting away with avoiding tax? And will he bring in a tax on windfill profits on the gas and oil industry? Prime Minister. M Mr Speaker, I'm very proud of my record as Chancellor in this country. Yeah. And, and, and maybe, maybe the Honourable Gentleman could talk to the 10 million people who had their jobs saved through furlough. Maybe he could talk to the millions of those on the lowest incomes who benefited from the changes we made to universal credit. This will always be a fair and compassionate government that has the most vulnerable at our hearts. Thank you. Robert Buckland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With only two out of ten uh, autistic adults currently in employment, 
it's clear that much more needs to be done to realise their potential. Will my right honourable friend work with me to make sure that business and industry help close that alarming employment gap? Yeah. Well, I, I know this, this is an area that my right honourable friend uh, rightly champions and knows an enormous amount about. I look forward to working with him closely to get his recommendations on how we and industry can improve the lives of those who need our help. Sarah Jones. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition asked the Prime Minister who broke the asylum system. He dodged the question. Yeah. Yeah. The truth, Mr. Speaker, is that the backlog is now so great, decision making so collapsed, and returns so low at a tenth of what they used to be, yeah. Yeah. that the criminal gangs have a business model to die for. Yeah. Whose fault is that? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the reason we are in this situation is because of the unprecedented number of people arriving here illegally, often from safe third countries. Now, if the party opposite was really serious about this, they would realise that we have to stop illegal migration, that we have to stop the exploitation of vulnerable people abroad. But they have opposed every single measure we have taken. They're not serious about this problem because they don't think it matters. Tom Hunt. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Both myself and many of my constituents remember fondly the Prime Minister's visit to Ipswich when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. We spoke about levelling up and he made it clear to me levelling up isn't just about one part of the country, it's a national mission. Yeah, Therefore, yeah. does the Prime Minister agree that a great way to show people of Ipswich this would be in support of our levelling up fund bit to get Ipswich active, £18 million, £15 million for Gaines Resort Centre, £3 million for the outdoor Lido in Broomhill? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, my old friend is right. Levelling up is about spreading opportunity in every part of our United Kingdom, ensuring people have pride in the place they call home. I look forward to seeing his levelling up fund bid, and I know it will be being considered over the course of this year, and I wish him every success. That completes Prime Minister's question.